My ram lambs here are a little bit on the small side. We're gonna talk about why that could be and what we're gonna do about it. We had a crazy windstorm yesterday and it got cold also, like this big cold front came in with it. Good morning, Priscilla. How are you? Yeah, are you in search of food? I did not check the temperature last night. I'm concerned that we may have had a frost overnight, so I'm gonna check the garden, see how it is before we get to morning chores and talking about the lambs. The sad thing is we're so close to tomato harvest. Here is one of my surviving tomato plants from the pig attack a couple months back. It looks a little sad. What do you see, Priscilla? Ooh, look at this guy. Let's see if we can catch him. Good chicken food here. Here you go, ladies. A little treat for you. Oh, that went fast. Uh, I don't know. This is looking pretty sad, though. This is not good. Now that I'm seeing the squash plant, it's definitely, it's definitely suffered some frost. This plant was just jamming a couple days ago. My other squash, that's done too now. Trying to get a good tomato harvest in North Idaho is pretty difficult. Our last frost date in the spring is pretty late, it's mid-May. And our early frost date in the fall, it's obviously early September. And it's just not quite a long enough window to get a great harvest. We're gonna harvest what we can from that garden another time. It's been a hectic enough morning. Today was little buddy's first day back at school. So we had to do all the early morning stuff. I'm sure all the other single parents out there feel my pain. I'm gonna knock out morning chores real quick and then we'll get to talking about the lambs. There are three main reasons why livestock don't grow as expected as or as one would hope. Number one is genetics, two is food or nutrition, and three is parasites. There's some other variables that can affect growth rates such as weather and stress, but those first three things I mentioned are those main, most common reasons why the animals aren't growing as we'd hope. The lamb on the right there standing up with the yellow collar around his neck, he's not doing bad. I was hoping he'd be a little bit bigger at this stage, but he's not like terribly small either. He's just a little bit on the low end of average. And the guy sitting down, he's definitely on the small side. He is, I, I, I really need to get him bigger before harvest. The other factor involved with the smaller guy here is age. He's a good month or so younger than the other one, so that is definitely a contributing factor to his size. However, he's still small for his age. So starting with reason number one, genetics. There's nothing I can do about the genetics. I can't fix their DNA to make them be larger animals. The best way to deal with that is dealing with that up front and that is, if you're buying lambs, to buy them from good genetics, a breeder who has good genetics, and buy them the best lambs that you can get. And if you're doing your own breeding program, be super selective in your breeding. And don't be breeding the sheep that don't need to be bred and bringing down your overall health of your flock. For me, in my circumstances, 
I came a little bit late into the buying of lambs this year. It was late spring before I was really sure that I wanted to buy lambs and because it's 2020 and we had the pandemic there was a huge uptick in people getting into homesteading and buying livestock so my livestock breeder that I use was sold out of all her ram lambs with the exception of one so the, the, the bigger of the two that I got was from her and then a friend of hers uh, sold me the other lamb here that I bought sight unseen and that lamb was born again later in the season so he's just smaller. I'm not saying my breeder Tess has bad genetics, in fact she has some really great genetics in her flock and I bought all my breeding stock when I had breeding stock from her. It's just that all of the best lambs had already been picked over by the time I got to this guy and again he was the only one left from her. Number two is food and nutrition. Now this is something that we can control to a degree. In ideal circumstances, we have our sheep out on pasture and they're grazing fresh forage all growing season and getting high quality nutrient dense forage. I'm standing inside of my mobile sheep corral right now. Originally the plan was to be able to move this thing daily. Sadly, the way I built it, it's a little too heavy. The wheels on it are too small. They're not really negotiating the pasture very well. So until I upgrade the wheel system on this thing, it's not something I can move by myself. Therefore, I can't move it daily because I'm here by myself. I'm only able to move it about once or twice a week when I'm able to get help over here, which is certainly not ideal. Because these guys are not foraging every day on fresh pasture, I'm having to supplement with hay. This is a really good hay. This is a grass alfalfa mix. You can see all the alfalfa mixed in there. It's really nice. This is the second cutting. This is grown all organically. It's a really nice product, but dry hay is never as good as lush grass growing out on pasture. There are two things I can be doing to help them with food and nutrition to hopefully get them to start growing faster. Number one is supplementing their feed with alfalfa pellets, certified organic, of course. And number two is giving them a kelp meal and selenium salt mix. So here I have certified organic alfalfa pellets that I just, whoops, that I just picked up from my local farm store. I don't know if you can read this on your screen, but the ingredients here are just organic sun-dried alfalfa. There's no additives to this at all. And this is crude protein, not less than 16%. So that's gonna give them a nice boost. If you're getting alfalfa hay or using alfalfa pellets, it's really best practice to use organic because if it's not organic, it's probably GMO alfalfa and sprayed with herbicides. The alfalfa pellets have another benefit, not just providing additional nutrition for the sheep, but putting them in this bucket and training them to the noise that their treat is in this bucket is a great way of getting the sheep to come back to you if they've managed to get out of their fencing. You just make that very distinct noise and they'll come running. Next up is getting the sheep kelp meal and the selenium salt. For kelp meal, I use the Thorven brand, the Icelandic geothermal kelp. It is certified organic. Kelp meal is loaded with minerals and pretty much has all the things in it that the sheep need, except for selenium, and that's where the selenium salt comes in. So the sheep need some salt anyway, but this salt has selenium with it, and selenium is super deficient in, in the soils in my region and many other regions around the country as well. So this gives them that selenium they need, the salt they need, and then everything else they need pretty much comes from the kelp meal. Normally I'd put the minerals in a mineral feeder, but I can't seem to find mine. I should have bought an extra one when I was at the farm store this morning getting the organic alfalfa pellets but I didn't. So we're just gonna use their alfalfa pellet bucket to put the minerals in, we'll hang it inside their corral and they'll be able to stick their heads in there and get what they need. If you're new to homesteading and you don't know where to source these things, 
I got the Thorvin Kelp Meal from Azure Standard as well as the Redmond Salt. You can order that from them. And the organic alfalfa pellets came from my local farm store, but you can also get them from Azure Standard. I don't worry too much about ratios and quantities with this kind of stuff. They'll eat it free choice and they'll only as, eat as much of it as they want. Uh, I just mix it kind of two to one kelp meal to salt, but just eyeballing it. As you can see, these guys are really digging it. They, <laughs> they're eating it like it's actually the alfalfa pellets in there. Moving these guys as much as I can, supplementing with hay feed, supplementing with alfalfa pellets, and making sure that they have their minerals. That's about all I can do with making sure they have the proper food and nutrition to help them reach size for harvest. That brings us to number three, parasites. Hey man, you got a little Something on your face there. Just a little parasites, most commonly tapeworms, can be found in the intestine of the sheep and of course it absorbs the nutrients from the food instead of the sheep being able to absorb it, thus depriving the sheep and them not getting the growth that they need. Having a small lamb or a skinny sheep is just one indicator that they might have parasites. An unscientific way to check is, of course, to look at the feces. And sometimes if they have a very high parasite load, you can see the parasite ache sacs kind of usually in between the pieces of fecal matter there you'll they look like pieces of white rice kind of wedged in there there aren't any visible in this sample but that doesn't mean they don't have parasites the scientific way to find out would be to do a fecal egg count if you have the right equipment and the patience you can do that at home or you can take a sample, package it up, and send it off to a lab. When you get the test results back, you can see whether your fecal egg count is too high and at a dangerous level for the animal, and then determine your course of treatment. There's some things you can do to treat the parasites. For me, chemical or pharmaceutical parasticides, dewormers, ivermectin, that, those kind of things, I don't use them. Of course, it's better to do preventative maintenance rather than having to treat an existing problem. But in that preventative maintenance, we can do a garlic molasses drench. Doing that garlic molasses drench quarterly can really keep any kind of parasite pressure down if you're using a rotational grazing program and moving the sheep regularly so they're not on one spot for weeks and weeks and weeks where they could be exposing themselves to more parasites. I had to take a little break to go pick up little Buddy from his first day of school. Hey little Buddy, how was your first day of school? It was good. Did you learn anything? No. Of it course was... not. Yeah, of course not. So where were we? Ah, parasites, that's right. Fecal egg count, determine if there's a problem, treat the problem. But preventative maintenance is where it's at. Garlic molasses treatment. Joel Salatin recommends putting Shackley soap in the water of the livestock and that helps with the parasites managing them. I personally haven't used Shackley and I'm not against that. It's just something you have to order. I think you have to have a membership. I use apple cider vinegar. Something you can get right off the shelf. It's organic. It doesn't take a whole lot of apple cider vinegar, just pour a little bit in there. As far as the fecal egg count goes, either sending it off or doing it at home, that's not something I'm going to do for these guys. They're only going to be around six, eight weeks tops before harvest. So by the time I'd get lab results back, it wouldn't really make that much of a difference anyway. And I don't have the microscope to do it at home. So I'm not going to be too worried about the parasite aspect of this. I'm just going to do the things I can do with the apple cider vinegar. And if I can round up a second person to give me a hand, we'll do the, the garlic and molasses drench. 
and I'll also make sure to keep on giving them their extra food supplements and hopefully we'll start seeing improvement with putting on some weight. Hey, will you go check to see if the chickens have laid any eggs? Uh, I haven't, but I'll go check right now. Okay. Let's see about six eggs. Six eggs, really nice. Six chickens, six eggs, 100% lay rate. We've been getting that about every day for the last couple of weeks. I'm gonna end this video out today with an announcement. Head on over to grassfedhomestead.com and click on shop in the menu. And for a limited time, you'll be able to access the merchandise available in the shop right now. That merchandise includes a certified organic grass-fed homestead t-shirt, among other things. And also there's a pre-order available for the Cottage Cuts film, which is gonna be a pork and lamb butchery film and cookery. The cart will only be open until September 11th, 2020. So if you're watching this on the day this was published, you only have two days left to get in there, order your merchandise or the cookbook or the film. And then after Friday, September 11th, 2020, the cart will close. I'd really appreciate it if you guys head on over there and check it out. It would mean the world to me if you find any merchandise or items in there of interest and decide to buy them. So thanks in advance for that.